Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Lisi Rogers, who's a doctor of podiatric medicine. Um, again, this is a, another physician that you should be putting in your toolbox as your partnership in your wellness. Uh, Dr. Lee Rogers is the medical director of the Amputation Prevention Center at Sherman Oaks Hospital in Los Angeles, specializing on treating the feet of those with diabetes and complications. He is the past chair of the Foot Care Council of the American Diabetes Association. He has published more than 100 papers or book chapters on topics related to diabetic foot. He uh, uh, completed his fellowship in limb salvage. He has been named as one of America's most influ influential podiatrists, as well as many other recognitions of excellence in his field. And as an aside, I believe he is currently a candidate for U.S. Congress in Los Angeles County. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I unfortunately have to report that I just lost the primary, oh. which I did, and it's and it's uh, it's real unfortunate because I won the primary last time, and I got very close to uh, to beating a guy who'd been in office for 20 years. Uh, we got within four points of beating him, and then he retired. So I, I ran again this time. And if you, if who, everybody, most people live in California here, so you know that we have this new primary system where the top two vote getters move on regardless of party. So I, I'm a Democrat, but I lost to two Republicans just because the turnout model was different, and they, and so two Republicans are on the ballot instead of, a, and there won't be a Democrat mm -hmm. on the ballot in the, in this, uh, this cycle. But anyway, so uh, enough of the tears, right? Life goes on. Uh, Eric Cantor just lost, so I know how he feels, right? Uh, <laughs> so I, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, about neuropathy and diabetes and what exactly are the risks of, uh, of this. And I used to be the chair for the Foot Care Council for the American Diabetes Association. I've, I've traveled around the world talking about this. You'll see some of my slides from some of the places I've, I've gone. I'll be in India on Tuesday, uh, also helping, uh, helping to... Uh, uh, to t train doctors there about how to deal with diabetes and neuropathy, but it's it's um, so it's it's diabetes that leads to a uh, leads to the neuropathy, but it's, then it's neuropathy that leads to all the conditions that may cause an amputation, which is probably the one of the more feared complications of diabetes. So we'll look. Uh, the diabetes is a in the United States is really a, uh, not really an epidemic anymore, it's, it's more of a, a pandemic. It's spreading not only across the United States, not spreading as in the fact of an infectious disease, but spreading in the fact that it's, the prevalence is becoming so much more, uh, it's becoming so much more prevalent. But you look at the increasing prevalence across the U.S., and you can see that in, in the past 15 years, 32 states had an increase of 50% of in the rate of diabetes. And the remaining states, the remaining 18 states, had, had an increase in 100% in the rate of diabetes. And this is leading to uh, actually an increase in, in cost for, uh, for health care and also uh, an increase in, in the complications. This, is the, uh, this happens to be a slide from the oldest surgery caught on video. This is from 1901, uh, Ernst von Bergman. And, uh, and he was doing the, the first surgery on video, which, which was a below the knee amputation, probably not related to diabetes, because at that point, it, it wasn't a, uh, a major cause of amputation. Now, it's the, it's the most common cause of amputation in the United States, 100,000 amputations a year as a result of diabetes and neuropathy. Uh, and George Bernard Shaw, who was a playwright from Ireland, he said that he marvels that society would pay a surgeon such a large sum of money to remove a person's leg, but nothing to save it. And that's still true in our pay for procedures type of, of healthcare system. And many of you, being healthcare consumers, uh, reading your EOBs when they come, understand that that doctors and hospitals get paid for doing things, not for prevent, preventing things. And that's that's been some of the talk about changing the healthcare system so that that there's a reward now for preventing things bad from happening instead of only doing procedures. So looking at the at the most common complications from diabetes. Uh, we, we always think about heart attack and stroke, right? People with diabetes, that's the most common reason that they would die is from a heart attack or a stroke. But if you look here, this is the percent increased risk uh, f from having a complication due to diabetes versus not having diabetes. So if you have diabetes, you have a 25% increased risk of, of having a stroke versus somebody without diabetes, 50% for a heart attack, 
uh, 65 percent for renal failure, 150 percent for dialysis. But look at, at your largest risk is actually having your leg or your foot amputated at at 200 percent or about 330 percent for your for your foot. So these are these are not rare complications anymore from diabetes, and uh, and in fact they're very costly. And I'll show you some of the data that we have on this. So looking around the world, it's not a problem that we only face here in the United States. These darker colored nations are the ones that have a much higher prevalence. In the United States, our prevalence is about 8% uh, of diabetes. And in, in some countries, uh, like I just got back from Saudi Arabia, it's 25% in Saudi Arabia. One out of every four adults has, has diabetes. And there's a lot of cultural reasons for these things that I, I won't get into now. If we have some time at the end, I can talk about it. But the, you can see the map, the heat map there. And if you look at it in uh, just in, in percentages, um, if you look at these top nations, in, and their percentages, you can see that a large majority of them are in the Middle East. And, and again, these are due to cultural reasons and, and the type of food that they eat and the, uh, uh, the, the lack of ex exercise and, and maybe even sunlight uh, for some women who are always covered uh, when they're, they're uh, due to their religious beliefs. So in, in some of these um, experiences that I've had, I went to Saudi Arabia, uh, I, I toured the, the wards, I was helping them out with, with patients that had already had amputations, like this unfortunate lady, and, and trying to uh, come up with strategies on how to, to prevent these things from occurring uh, in, in not only in the same patient, you can see she already has an amputation on one side, and, uh, and we're, we're trying to prevent her from having a full leg amputation on the other side. But also in Dubai, where it's, it's interesting because that's kind of the pinnacle of healthcare for the whole, whole of the Middle East. Dubai is a very wealthy um, city. It's the United Arab Emirates. It's a very wealthy country. The wealthiest city in the world is, is probably Doha, Qatar, which is just not very far from there. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this has to be at least the second wealthiest city in the, in the world. Uh, and, uh, and that's the tallest building in the world, the, the Burj Khalifa, which is the, uh, you saw it on, on the latest uh, Mission Impossible. Uh, video where he's, uh, he's climbing outside of this building. It's 162 stories uh, tall. By the way, when I was in there, they were talking about apartments, and they said anything, uh, in the, anything between, uh, if, it's, if it's below the 98th floor, it's considered mid-level. So anything above the 98th floor is high level. Uh, and, and so a lot of the problems are due to, and this is true in our country as well, but it's even, even more so there, you can see a direct relationship between footwear and lesions in their feet related to neuropathy and diabetes. Uh, and, and when everybody wears sandals, because that's the thing to wear, uh, and, and it's a very hot and dry climate, and they get cracks in their feet that lead to ulcers like this and infections, that causes a lot of amputations in their, in their country. So one of the things that we were doing when we were over there was just teaching them how to do, uh, and this is interesting too, because their operating rooms are beautiful that they have in Dubai. They have all the, all the equipment that you ever anticipate having in a US operating room, sometimes more. I was opening up brand new stuff that they had bought two years ago they didn't know how to use, so I was teaching them how to use this stuff. Uh, and, and so we're, we're, but we're teaching them the basics on how to just use casts to take the pressure off the bottom of the feet so that people can walk, like this gentleman here, this was a video, it's not playing, but he was walking with it in his, uh, in his uh, Arab dress, walking and uh, with his cast on after we had done surgery on him. And, uh, and so it's, it's, a lot of times it's the simple things that make the biggest difference. And so this comes from our hometown newspaper, the LA Times, and you can see in the background it comes from the business section of the LA Times, not the health section, and it says uh, soaring diabetes rates wake the prosthetic industry. Uh, and, and so that's, you know, used to be only after a war would we see a lot of people with prosthetics. And, and certainly after wars, we have a lot more research that goes into prosthetics. And, and even if you, if you have another condition, whether it's a motorcycle accident or diabetes that leads to an amputation, the prosthetics are much better now because we've had uh, wars for the past 15 years and, and there've been a lot, of, a lot of research into prosthetics. Um, so we, we look at what we call the natural history about how somebody with diabetes gets to the point of having an amputation. So we, and, and I call it the stairway to an amputation. So it's not just a one-step process that just because you have diabetes, it'll end in an amputation. There are several steps that occur in between those two endpoints, and, and doctors can do something when you, when you go from one step to the next and actually prevent you from moving to the next step and, and de-escalate your, your risk. So the first step is obviously the diagnosis of diabetes. After about eight to 12 years, people develop peripheral sensory neuropathy. That leads to unfelt repetitive trauma from walking, and that causes an ulcer. 
uh, that those ulcers usually start at, as uh, either calluses or blisters, and they turn into full thickness ulcers in the skin. And, uh, and then patients may or may not have vascular disease in their lower extremities uh, in combination with that. But it's usually the infection that's the coup de grace, the final blow, that leads to an amputation. And, uh, and so if we can do something to prevent the, because these, these go in order pretty much all the time. If we can do something to prevent somebody from moving from one step to the next, we can ultimately prevent that amputation, and that's what we focus on. So we know that 25% of those with diabetes will develop a diabetic foot ulcer in their lifetime, and around half of them will become infected, and around one in five of those will require an amputation. So that's, that's really the, the bad news, and that's what we have to start with to, to look at doing something. And we also know that, that it's a poor prognosis once you get an amputation, that, that following a lower extremity amputation, 50% undergo an amputation of the other leg in two to five years. And, uh, and then that's not the only bad news because you look at the relative mortality rate, this means, this, that what this is showing is that 68% of people with diabetes that have an amputation, 68% of them will be dead within five years. And, and it's not because you had an amputation that causes your death. It's, it's generally because, one, if you're sick enough to have an amputation, you're generally pretty ill. And, and you take somebody who's pretty ill, and you force a somewhat sedentary lifestyle upon them because they're, they may not have the capacity to rehabilitate and use a prosthetic. Or maybe they're doing it a little bit, but they're not getting back to full activity. And so that's kind of a downward spiral. It's very common uh, or similar to how patients, um, when, they get a, when they have a hip fracture, you may have hear, hear of some some uh, um, elderly, especially women, who have hip fractures and uh, from osteoporosis, they go in the nursing home. The hip fracture doesn't kill them, but, but three months in a nursing home will kill them because they're, they decompensate. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, there's a very high mortality rate after, after hip fracture in the elderly. Um, so we look at this compared to various cancers, and we see that, you know, really it's second only to lung cancer as, as the mortality rate in five years. And that's, when we, that's why we've argued over and over again, I've been active on the federal level, trying to get more funding to, uh, to um, um, prevent, not only prevent diabetes and treat diabetes appropriately, but, but to prevent amputations in diabetes. So we, we wrote an article in, uh, in 2008, and this is when I was working in Iowa. And the, you probably know Iowa politically is only important once every four years during a presidential election. And, you, and if you ever want to meet a presidential candidate, you just hang out at the Iowa State Fair, and they're all running around there uh, eating, their, eating their whatever that comes fried on a stick, which is a bad example. But uh, we, we wrote an article, and, and we titled it, we, we were playing, doing a play on words on the right to bear arms. We said the right to bear legs, an amendment to health care. And, and we looked at the, at the cost of lower extremity amputations in the United States in 2007. We wrote this article in 2008. And, uh, and we found that it was $30 billion was spent uh, on, on amputations and foot ulcers in the U.S. in 2007, which was a sixth of the total cost of diabetes. Was, was attributed just to this. And, and then we looked at, at um, then we looked at simple cost preventative measures like uh, a regular visit to a, a podiatrist once a year or, or good shoes or these new things that I'll show you at the very end here, which is which are using thermal scans to look at people's feet with, with uh, temperature scanning. And, and it can warn you when a condition is about to occur. These, these simple things can reduce that cost of $30 billion down, it can reduce it by about $20 billion, so it can cut it in, uh, into, a, into a third uh, of what we'd be spending. And, and this is based on literature that's already been published. So we've, we've done a lot of advocating on how do we prevent these amputations. Well, one of the best ways to do it is to, uh, for doctors, is to form a team of people that deal with it, because not one type of doctor can treat all of the things that are necessary to prevent your amputation. There's, there, you need an infectious disease specialist, you need a podiatrist, you need an orthopedic surgeon, you need a vascular surgeon, maybe a plastic surgeon, an endocrinologist. So the problem is when one doctor tries to take control of the whole situation and doesn't want to refer out to the other doctors, then, then you, uh, you end up not getting the expertise of everybody on the team, and not one person knows everything that's needed or can do everything that's needed to prevent that amputation. So the first thing is for the doctors to form and the hospitals to form these teams. If you're a patient, I would, I would suggest that you look for a place that has team, 
as a team approach to doing this. The, uh, the more common places are wound care centers. You know, we see about wound care centers all the time, but they generally have at least the, the rudimentary structure of a team set up. We talked more about these limb salvage centers, which was a, an even higher level than a wound care center. Uh, we call ourselves the Amputation Prevention Center. And, uh, and so we wrote this. This was published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery, and, uh, and it, it was on the cover, actually. They put my stairway to an amputation on the cover of the, of the magazine in, in 2010. Uh, but we described the different, the different um, levels of care, basic, b basically like uh, if you're familiar with how, the, uh, how hospitals have trauma classifications, a level one trauma center, level two, or level three trauma center. The, we thought about the same type of thing. Either you have basic, intermediate, or center of excellence level of care. And so we wrote about this so that people could do this more and, uh, and prevent amputations. And then we've written a lot, too, about how limb salvage, preventing, limb, preventing amputations, is, is, a, is really a philosophy. And it's, it's, uh, you can walk into a doctor's office or be wheeled in with your, if you have a pro major problem with your leg uh, or your foot, and that, sometimes that doctor might say, you know what, they've got diabetes. We hear this all the time in the surgeon's lounge. They've got diabetes, they're gonna lose their leg anyway. Why are we wasting all this money and time you know, doing it? Let's just cut the leg off now. And the reason is because we know the mortality rate afterwards. And so if we can save the leg as long as possible, we can prevent the amputation. And, uh, and so we can prevent the, the untimely death. So we, uh, so we talk about having the right philosophy that, that the team you know, subscribes to this philosophy that we'll, we'll do all that we can to save the leg. Now, sometimes you get to a point where it's either not salvageable uh, or it's, uh, it may be worse for the patient to try to save it uh, if, if there's nothing that, that can be done and, and this extra care might, might harm them. So you have to take those things into consideration too. But it's, uh, we always say it's better to save than, than to lose it. But, uh, so how do these diabetic ulcers form, which, which leads to these amputations? And, and it's really simple, actually. And you can think about this um, if you have diabetes and you have neuropathy. This is something really easy to think about. But it's, it's the cycles of repetitive stress. So that basically, it's the number of steps per day that you're taking multiplied by the pressure on the bottom of your feet. Uh, and that equals trauma. So if you, have, if you have high pressure on the bottom of your feet because you have a deformity, like rheumatoid arthritis, or you have, um, you, as you're getting older, you lose the fat pad underneath your feet, and so the bones become more prominent. When you push with your finger, you can kind of feel that the bones are more prominent. Uh, or you have a, a, a bunion or some other condition that leads to high pressure on the bottom of your feet. The more steps you take per day on that high pressure is going to lead to an ulcer. So you can have, some, you could have a really ugly-looking foot that is that from rheumatoid arthritis that's all deformed and if you never step on it in a day you'll never get a foot ulcer right so that so we can agree on that part so now in the middle we have to find how many steps per day can you take because that's the one thing you can modify you can modify the pressure too by getting good footwear to take the pressure off with the footwear or also sometimes get having surgery on your foot to to realign the joints so that there's less pressure or if there's a bump somewhere we can shave off the bump and, and that'll reduce the pressure. So there, there are different things you can do to reduce pressure, but in, in your hands, really, the one thing that you can do is, is adjust the number of steps that you're taking per day, and I'll show you some things on that, too, as we move along. So how do we take pressure off of the feet? Now, it's different if you have an ulcer versus if you don't have an ulcer. If you have a full thickness ulcer that's down into the, in, into the subcutaneous tissue, it's all red, sometimes they're infected, you've gotta do all that you can to take the pressure off to, in order to get that to heal. So we'll use things like these half shoes, we'll use a, a cast, uh, sometimes, sometimes we use these cast boots. Um, if you can see the pointer, which I don't think you can very well, but this one down here is just a diabetic shoe that this is for people that have already healed that you're trying to uh, just prevent pressure on their feet from that. And, uh, and so then, but we always ask, does the end justify the means? Like, this is a very good way. This way most doctors would prefer to do this with their patients. Uh, and they, we, then we know there's no pressure whatsoever on their feet. But yeah, yeah, so we always try to keep people active while we're taking pressure off of their feet because we know that if, if we say, okay, it's, it's time it's now for bed rest or crutches, we know that that's not going to be good for you in the long run because you're going to decompensate. So if we can do something to keep you active, let you get up and go to the bathroom, do, it, do what you need to do in your house, your activities of daily living, while we're still taking the pressure off. That's the best thing uh, for you. And people with diabetes tend not to do very well with crutches anyway because they, they you know, with neuropathy, and I assume most of you have neuropathy, they, um, with neuropathy you can't feel 
your, your other leg that you're hopping on very well, and, and you run the risk of falling or, or tripping uh, on that other leg if you're using crutches. And, uh, and then um, people with type 2 diabetes tend to be obese, and, and they don't have as much cardiovascular reserve when they're using the, the crutches. And it takes a lot of work, actually, to use crutches. We had a, a, a hospital administrator uh, at another hospital I worked at uh, broke his ankle. Young, healthy guy, played racquetball. And he, uh, he, would, he would come in every day with a, on his crutches, and he'd have his laptop bag strapped around his, his, uh, his shoulder. And by the time he'd make it up to his office, he'd be drenched in sweat. And he's a, he's a, a young, healthy guy that plays racquetball, but because it's a, it's a lot of energy to use crutches. So we look at you know, offloading and common sense, taking the pressure off. That's what offloading is. And so we have two options here that we do to take pressure off of people who have, have foot ulcers. One is a cast, and that works for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it, one, it immobilizes the ankle. So if you can't bend your ankle, you can't push down with your, the front of your foot. So if you can't push down with the front of your foot, the pressure on the front of your foot is reduced. Uh, the other thing it does is it, is it acts like an exoskeleton, like a, you know, insects or crabs have an exoskeleton. The soft stuff is on the inside, the hard stuff's on the outside compared to you know, our soft stuff's on the outside. Uh, and it's, so it acts like an exoskeleton because if you picture what a calf looks like compared to an ankle, it's, it's, um, it's conical in shape. And if you, if you put a hard shell around the outside of it and you put pressure on it, that leg is gonna be forced into that conical structure and it's gonna take some pressure off the bottom. Uh, now sometimes people don't have conical shaped ankles, they have cankles, and then that's, that's more tubular shaped and then that becomes a problem, so we have to do something different. But this, uh, in this, this case, with, with conically shaped lower extremities, you can, you can uh, offload very well. So the other option is providing a removable device like that one over there, which you've seen most, most often they're black. This one is, a, is, a, uh, is a, a, basically a bivalve, it's got two shells. And, uh, um, and so we can look at them in the laboratory, and we can see all the way over here on the, on the left that the total contact cast offloads the bottom of the foot just about as, as well as the walker does uh, in the laboratory. But then the problem is we get back, so we, we say, okay, well, then they're equal. Then we get back to the, to the clinic, and we look at them in study, and we see, <coughs> and this is, this is hard to see, um, that there's a blue line that goes all the way down to the bottom, then there's a, a red dotted line kind of there halfway through the middle. The, the blue line is the total contact cast, and we see that the total contact cast heals ulcers much better than the removable cast walker, even though they take the pressure off in the bottom, you know, the bottom of the foot equally in the, in the laboratory. Well, the issue is um, that when, we, when we've, we've studied the behavior of patients, and we, we uh, so what we, we did was we gave them a pedometer on their hip, and we lied to them. We told them we were monitoring their activity. This was an approved study, by the way, so we were allowed to lie to them. But we, we lied to them and said, we're doing, we're, we're doing a study to see how much activity you do in a day. And we gave them a pedometer and they wore it on their hip. And then we buried another device, another pedometer inside their device, and they didn't know it was in there. And so when they came back, we compared the number of steps that their hip took versus the number of steps that their device took, and we found that patients only wore their device for 30% of their walking steps, uh, even though they were told never, never to take it off. So we, uh, you know, about 90% of the problem with the removable cast walker is in a third of its name, it's removable. So we have to, we have to do things to render it irremovable or, uh, or use the cast to instead to do that. So in the, and these devices are, are pretty easy to use, the casts especially. These new casts roll on like a sock, and they just roll on and they, they harden and dry, and patients seem to like them uh, to take off the, the pressure. So then the other way of doing it is activity monitoring, and this is after you've already had a healed ulcer. So if, if we put a cast on you, a cast is kind of like a ball and chain. You know, you, you, we know that people walk a lot less when they have a cast on because it's cumbersome, it's difficult to walk around, and, and their stride length is actually a lot shorter on the side that they have the cast on anyway. So the contact on the ground, because you're kind of limping around with that cast on, so the, so the contact on the ground is a lot, is a lot shorter, the, number, the amount of time that foot spends on the ground, so we know that also reduces the pressure. But one of the ways that we can do this is, is we've, we've thought about this a lot, is how to prescribe activity like we prescribe a drug. And we say, okay, look, we know your threshold, because of your foot shape and, and the pressure on the bottom of your feet, we know your threshold for getting an ulcer is 3,000 steps a day. And so when you hit, hit 2,500 steps, we, we, you get a device, 
And that, when you hit 2,500, that thing's like a pager starts beeping and telling you only got 500 steps left before you need to stop, uh, you know, stop your activity and not walk anymore. Now, we're, we're working through some of the kinks. You know, we have to get people to be more compliant with it. But if that can prevent you from getting your leg amputated, I think it's a pretty good uh, and reasonable thing to do. Uh, so we also look at infections. And we, and we can classify infections, you know, mild infections, moderate infections, and severe infections based on how extensive the redness is or how deep the infection goes or whether or not, there's, whether or not you're having a systemic sign of that infection. People with diabetes don't always have the same signs of an infection that people without diabetes do. Diabetes causes a, an, immune, uh, an immune suppression, basically. And, and so you don't, people with diabetes and infections don't always have a fever. Uh, in fact, in, in one study, only 56% of patients with diabetes and infection had an elevated white blood cell count. And that's the one thing that doctors commonly look for to determine whether or not you have an infection. So if it's a flip of the coin, whether or not you have an infection, whether, whether your white blood cell count's going to be elevated, that's really not a good test to do to, to determine it. So infections are really clinical diagnoses. You know, you look at it. If it looks infected, it's infected. And you start treating them for, for an infection at that point. So we, we know that if we can either keep somebody mildly infected or not infected, their wound, that their risk of going into the hospital and having their leg amputated is very low. But if, if something happens when they get a moderate infection, and then certainly when it gets to be a severe infection, their risk of going in the hospital and getting an amputation is, is much, much higher. So looking at, at one of the things that we can do to help prevent ulcers, and, and this is a, um, uh, I'm, I was able to meet Dr. Brand once before he died, uh, and he, uh, he died in his 90s in, uh, uh, he was a, a surgeon, a hand surgeon actually, but then started doing work on the feet. Uh, he was British and went and, and studied people with leprosy in India. And he was in India for years and years and years before he came to the United States and worked in the, in the leprosorium in Carville, Louisiana, where we kept um, you know, people in the United States with leprosy. And, uh, and leprosy causes a lot of the same problems with neuropathy that diabetes does. So that's why we use a lot of the research that's been done in patients with leprosy. We use that to to study now uh, for diabetes. But he, he, had, he had written a book called, and it's, and it's cut off there a little bit, but it's called Pain, The Gift Nobody Wants. And, we, and with neuropathy, you talk about how, you know, some neuropathy is painful, some neuropathy is painless, but the absence of pain becomes a big problem. If you think about, you know, not having pain in your hand, and if you accidentally touched a hot stove, if you, your, your, your brain tells you right away to pull that hand back. I mean, it's an immediate reaction for you to pull your hand back. But if you don't have that gift of pain, as, as Dr. Brand calls it, then you don't have that, re, that your brain is not telling you to pull your hand back, and you have to wait till you smell burning flesh or see something burning until you can pull your hand back. And so, that, so this is the same thing that happens in feet of, with people with diabetes and neuropathy. You're, you're having trauma over and over again. And if, you're, if you don't have neuropathy and you walk around in a mall and... It, um, and you are wearing poor shoes, which happens sometimes, right? You walk around in a mall, and you, and you start to have pain on the outside of your foot. Well, you might think to yourself, eh, these shoes are not really good for me. They, I'm starting to have pain. Uh, but subconsciously, you actually change the way that you walk, and you start to put more pressure on the inside of your foot as you're walking. And that takes the pressure off the outside of the foot. And, and so that's what you're missing when you don't have that pain. You just walk on that same sore spot over and over again until it ulcerates. Uh, and so when we look at... at Pain, uh, when we look at, at um, ulcers, they all start out as being inflamed beforehand. This gives us clues on how to prevent these things from happening. If you have neuropathy and no ulcer, you can look at these and say, okay, well, what can I do to determine whether or not I've, I've had too much trauma? So the, the cardinal signs of inflammation, dolor, rubor, tumor, and calor, they're Latin names for pain, dolor. Rubor is redness, tumor is swelling, and calor is heat. Uh, so pain is something that we've all been, we've all grown up with, knowing that when when we have inflammation, if you have a tennis elbow and it's inflamed, it's going to hurt. It's going to it's going to splint itself. Basically, it's going to tell you not to move it because it hurts too much. Well, you, so that's gone because of neuropathy. Rubor is redness. That's really hard to measure. As uh, you can look at something and say, okay, well, it's red or it's not red, but it's hard to measure. Tumor is swelling. You, that's actually easy to measure, but it's it's um or it's 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 very specific to measure. You can stick somebody's leg in a, in a water bath and you can see how much the water increases and that'll, that'll tell you how much volume there is to that extremity, but that's kind of difficult. But then calor is heat. And heat is, is for, especially for inflammation, it's very sensitive uh, for inflammation. So we use things like this. This is a, uh, 
And th there's a home device too. So this is the expensive one that we use in the clinic. But th this is thirteen thousand dollars. We bought it. It's a, it's a, uh, um, it's a thermal imager. So it's the same thing that that the military uses to find Al Qaeda in caves, or or uh, the police can see people behind walls. I find out where my nurses are. You know, if they're slacking <laughs> off, I look around the clinic. And uh, and so this is a this is something that we can use to look at people's feet with. So here's just an example of what it'll do. Uh, this is, it takes two images at the same time. So it takes a visual image and an infrared image. And, uh, and so the infrared image is the one that you can't see with your eyes, right? But it picks up heat. And, and the visual image, uh, so this was, in, this was when I was in Iowa, because uh, we don't have basements here in, in California. But when I was in Iowa, we had, a, we, we had our basement. Uh, I, I went down, we shut off all the lights, and it, and it marks the hottest thing in the room uh, or the hottest thing in the viewfinder. And, and we can see that the hottest thing in the viewfinder is the is the eyeball of my cat. And, uh, and so, the, uh, so we can look at people's feet like this. So this was a, this was a, uh, a gentleman who had a, you can see some stereo strips down there. So he's laying on the table on his belly and he had some, some uh, he had a, a piece of glass foreign body that was in his foot. So we had done surgery on it and, and took out the glass foreign body. We put him in a cast. And then he came in and said, you know, my heel's been bothering me a little bit since I've been in the cast. And one of the complications, if you don't pad the cast well enough, is that you can get a, a heel ulcer from the cast. And so we noticed some redness there, and so we said, well, let's just image him with the, with the thermal imager. And you can see a great difference in the temperature there, so 89 degrees on one side versus 96 degrees on the other. So that, in fact, predicted that he was going to get a, a heel ulcer based on the fact that there was so much inflammation there. So here's another patient with, um, and this patient came in that we were doing, uh, so one of the things that, here's, here was an ulcer, I'm not sure you can see the pointer. It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to see, but there was an ulcer right underneath the, uh, on the, in your view, it's his left foot, but in your view, it's on, the, uh, it's on the right side. There's a little spot there, kind of in the middle of the foot, distally, uh, in the middle of the foot, underneath the ball of the foot, that you can see is healed now. That used to be an ulcer, and it was all the way down to his bone. And, and one of the things we did to heal that was we had lengthened his Achilles tendon because that took pressure off of, his, off of the front of his foot. And one of the complications are if you, if you get back to activity too early or you have some type of trauma, you can rupture your Achilles tendon after you lengthen it because we weaken it, basically, so it can rupture. So then he came in, and he, didn't, he had neuropathy, so he didn't feel that he ruptured it, but he came in and said, you know, I'm walking around, and I just feel like my heel is fat when I'm walking on it. And, that, and so if you rupture your Achilles tendon, you end up putting way too much pressure on your heel, uh, in, during your gait cycle. So we did a thermal image of him, and we can see that, that he, in fact, did have a, a very hot heel, which, which would, if we didn't offload him and, and take the pressure off, would, he would get an ulcer on that heel and then may end up losing his leg because that's something really difficult to treat in that location. So here's another, another patient with a... Um, uh, and his feet are, are kind of at different angles. They're not different sizes and, or swollen. But uh, he, he had... Uh, he had some, he had some uh, deformity that just started to occur in, on your left, but on his right foot. And, uh, and so we, we took a, uh, we were looking for some, a condition called Charcot foot, and I can explain that later if you want, but it's, it's something that really causes a lot of inflammation in a foot. And so we looked at his heat image, and you can see that he's, he's got a lot of heat there. So then we said, okay, well, let's, let's see if we can start to cool this down, and we started doing ice baths with him to see, uh, so this is a, um, this is called a cryo cuff, this thing over here, and that's something we, we use for people after they have knee replacements, we put one on the knee and it, it reduces the inflammation, so it, ice water gets pumped into this thing over and over again, and there's a little port on there where you can put the ice water in. So we started doing this where we could, where we could just cool him down to prevent this ulcer from occurring, and we can get him down to where his, his temperatures were normal. So abnormal on the right, or on the left, and normal on the right there. So. You know, one of, the th one of my favorite sayings from Will Rogers, no relation to me, he says that, that even if you're on the right track, you're going to get run over if you just sit there. And that's so true in, this, in these type of patients because you're, you're dealing with neuropathy, which is a very severe complication of diabetes. And if you're not moving fast enough, then you're just going to get run over by that ulcer or that infection. And so that's, that's why we, you know, we advocate really moving fast. And so we have our, we have our center in, at Sherman Oaks Hospital, which we call the Amputation Prevention Center. That all, all we do are see people with, with neuropathies, not all diabetes, it's probably 95% diabetes, but we see people with neuropathy and some, some condition in their leg that might risk uh, an amputation. 
and uh, and so we're uh, we're easy to find though if anybody needs to to get a hold of us. But I I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions if you have any questions. Yes. So the, what, what importance does losing weight play into relieving pressure on the bottom of the feet? Surprisingly, they've done lots of studies, and they found that it doesn't matter whether you're, you're obese or you're skinny. The pressure on the feet really isn't, isn't related to that, because it's, uh, it, and it, it's not a risk for ulceration. But it's, it, is, it does show uh, it, it is a risk for worsening diabetes and worsening neuropathy, but it doesn't directly relate to, to foot ulcers. Yeah. Yes. Right. And I said to the doctor, can you take me down my foot, put it on my face, <laughs> or Botox? I don't know. I think Botox, but I'm, I'm So the, she's, she was told that she lost some of the fatty tissue underneath the ball of her foot, and, uh, and that's called fat pad atrophy, and that causes an increase in pressure because there's no, you don't have cushion there anymore, so the bones are very prominent. If you don't have neuropathy, it can be painful. If you do have neuropathy, it's not painful, but it risks an, an ulcer. Um, the, they can't take uh, fat from your butt and put it down on your foot. Th not that they can't do it, they have done it, and it just doesn't work because it doesn't stay in one place. Uh, they, but there are other things that we can put down there. So we, we have, uh, there's, a, 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 um, there's something called Sculptra, and it's a plastic surgery injection that is used for the face and people with, with HIV and lipoatrophy, so when their face kind of gets sunken in, they inject this in, in their face. Um, that's not FDA approved for this, uh, but none, none of the things are FDA approved for using in the foot to, to, to restore the fat pad. Another thing is actually injecting silicone, which, which people are afraid of because of the more proximal uses of silicone have resulted in a lot of lawsuits. But, the, uh, but um, they've shown that the silicone doesn't move once they, they put it in underneath, that, uh, underneath those balls, the, the ball of the foot. And one other one is actually there's a, there's a skin product that we use that's been processed skin. It's human skin, but it's been processed, so it's just the collagen from the skin. And it's an injectable as well, and we can just inject that underneath those, um, uh, those bones. And, and it goes away faster, so you might need like two injections a year. But if you need two injections a year and you prevent an ulcer and an amputation, that's worth it, I think. You're welcome. Uh, is exercise that you use as a therapeutic for cancer? Because I, I, I've never heard, I, all day I've never heard the word used at all. Yeah, so uh, the question is about exercise. In, um, but we... Uh, we commonly get in arguments with cardiologists over this all the time. And, it, and so one doctor tells a patient, you need to, you've got diabetes and a heart problem. We need you to walk around the block three times a day and, and get the exercise. But that's actually worse for their feet. And uh, because the more number of steps you take per day, the worse that it is for, for, uh, for the higher prediction you are for getting an ulcer. So you, the first thing you have to do is, is put them on a risk spectrum. If, if you have diabetes but you don't have neuropathy, you're not going to get an ulcer, so you can walk as much as you want. If you have diabetes and you have neuropathy, maybe we can get you to walk some numbers of steps. You can keep track of it with a, with a pedometer. You can take your own foot temperature when you get back home because we have these, these smaller ones that only cost $100 for people to use at home. And, uh, and then you can see if you have a hot spot. No hot spot, you're fine. You get a hot spot, then you need to walk less. Uh, yeah, not really, because the, when you, neuropathy is a condition not only of the sensory nerves, but also of the motor nerves. And, and so it's going uh, to affect the calf muscles and the anterior leg muscles, the front of the leg muscles too. And, and so exercising for neuropathy is not going to make any difference. Exercising for diabetes, exercising for heart disease, that, that will make a difference. But exercising for neuropathy really won't. Yeah. You're going to have a bunch more questions. Okay. I think what we're going to have to do is take a break.